Well, we are back in the book of Luke today following the travels of Jesus as he begins a new ministry. He now has his eyes set on Jerusalem and he knows that he's going to the cross. He's trying to warn his disciples over and over and it's just not coming up on their radar. They're just not getting it. We're going to talk a little bit about being a disciple today as Jesus teaches us and as the uh, disciples are a great example for us to not follow uh, in many respects. And, and you'll see what I'm talking about uh, as we go through. Um, I'm so glad that the Bible was written by real people, inspired of the Holy Spirit, and they wrote the truth. Because if I were to write the Bible, it would not sound the way it sounds. If I wrote the Bible and I was talking about myself, I would say all the good things about myself and just erase 98% of my life and not mention anything I've ever done wrong. Yep. <laughs> and the Bible doesn't do that. So anybody that thinks they're trying to put together some kind of a sales presentation to make believe that Jesus was who he said he was and who he demonstrated he was by raising, raising from the dead just hasn't read the Bible. So guys, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, the opportunity to be here, uh, able to meet in a place where we're not under persecution, where we can read your word, Lord, as it is uh, your word. I pray that you would help us to accept it as it is, that you'd help us in our minds and our hearts, that we would pay attention to your words, that your spirit would bring new life into us with it, that you might speak to each one as you do in an individual way to show us the things that each one of us needs. Lord, I'm so grateful to be here. I'm thankful for all the people that are here and, and those who are listening online. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit might renew our minds and our hearts today and help us to remember what it is to serve the risen Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. So the passage I've chosen today is Luke 9, 57. It says, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Well, I imagine how many of you have decided to give your life to Jesus and follow him wherever he leads you to go? See, so that's a pretty common statement. Although sometimes it's said with a lot of bravado in the sense that, uh, you know, you're going to make these things happen. By golly, and I'm going to be the best disciple you ever saw. You'll be so glad you picked me. <laughs> and unfortunately, we find out all too quickly that our flesh is not what it takes to live a holy life. So as we look at Luke, I'll just remind you where you are. And... What we've looked at in chapter eight, we looked at the power of Jesus over the waves and the wind. We saw him take charge of some demoniacs, cast out demons, and uh, just his power over all of these things, over sickness and death. A woman that comes and says, I know if I just grab a hold of him, I'll be, I'll be okay. And she gets healed of bleeding. She had been bleeding for 12 years as Jesus was on his way to heal a 12 year old girl. And he gets there and uh, she's dead and he raises her from the dead and gives her back to her parents. And then Jesus empowers his disciples to cast out demons and heal and preach the gospel. So he sends them out two by two. They have this wonderful time of ministry and he says, guys, let's pull aside and let's, uh, you know, kind of decompress and you can tell me all your stories, uh, uh, your heroics of what you've done. But they're interrupted as they go to the house of fish. Uh, they get interrupted by all of the people and the compassion of Jesus. He makes them sit down, has them sit down in groups of 50 and 100, and he feeds 5,000 people off of a little boy's lunch. And so we saw that Jesus has the power to make things happen when we seem that there's no way. He makes a way. And then last week, we looked at Jesus' identity. When he was revealed in his glory as he went up to the Mount of Transfiguration, he was meeting with uh, Elias, it says, but it's Elijah, we would pronounce it, and Moses, representing both the law and the prophets, goes up and they spoke of his exodus. They spoke of him leaving, going to the cross. And this is the turning point in Jesus's ministry as he begins to look steadfastly to the cross and training his disciples with that in mind that, you know, he's not going to be around forever. He's probably three years into his ministry, so he's got about six months 
to, to get this crack team of people just like us <laughs> in shape for him to leave. And we saw him talk about going to the cross and he said, let these things sink into your ears. The, the son of man is just going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and he's going to be hung on a cross and die, but on the third day he will rise. And they didn't get it. Of course, after the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus comes down and the 10 disciples at the foot, uh, or the uh, nine disciples at the, the foot of the mountain are there with all of the crowds of people. And there's a boy who's been possessed by a demon and the disciples can't do a thing for him. Kind of a moment of failure. And Peter, James, and John come down with Jesus off this wonderful mountaintop experience right into the need of human beings. Uh, you've been there. If you've ever been to a men's retreat, a woman's retreat, or any kind of a thing like that, you have this wonderful time with the Lord and it's just deep, intimate, and then you're, you have to go home. And as soon as you go home, something happens. And you have to go right into the face of human need. And that's just the way that life is, isn't it? Just, well, it is for me. So you, you'll see. And so today we're looking at 46 to 62 in chapter 9, and it's about being a disciple. What, what it is to be a disciplined follower of Jesus Christ, uh, which is where the word disciple comes from. Let's pick it up in verse 46. Then a dispute arose among them as to which one of them would be greatest. Yeah, that's why it just kind of stands alone all by itself. They have this great time on the mountain, Peter, James, and John, and hey, let's make three booths. And God the Father steps in and says, hey, Peter, shut it. This is my son. Listen to him. Don't put him on par with these guys. Just listen to what he's telling you. So they come down from the mountain having this great experience. And Jesus says, guys, don't tell anybody what you just saw until after I'm risen. And you wonder, why would he, why? I mean, does Jesus ever tell you not to tell anybody about Jesus? No, but these guys were half-baked. They weren't all there yet. And Jesus had some more teaching to do before they could be great representatives. So he just said, don't say anything, please. You'll just be a bad advertisement. So at least that's my opinion. I could be wrong. And immediately they have a dispute among them, which would be the greatest? Nine of them were down there and couldn't cast a demon out when they were able to. And Jesus expressed his disgust. And he said, oh, faithless generation, how long am I going to have to bear with you? Speaking of his disciples, not able to do something that the Lord empowered them to do. And the next thing they do is they have an argument about who's the greatest. Can you imagine how that went? I find it a principle when people feel like they have to build themselves up, it's because there's something wrong. Or you wouldn't have to pat yourself on the back so vehemently. Why do you need to pat yourself on the back at all? It says, if any good is to be spoken of you, let it be of another man's lips and not your own. Uh, which, which makes an, a job interview very difficult. But anyway, <laughs> letters of recommendation are better than you saying anything. Then a dispute arose, which one would be greatest? They had this wonderful experience and a tremendous failure at the foot of the mountain. Notice Peter didn't push everybody aside and said, I got this, Lord. Walk up like John Wayne. I, I, can just, I can't do a good John Wayne voice, but I, I wish I could. And Peter said, I'll take care of this. I'll cast him out. You know, and uh, no, Jesus takes care of it. And they, they all have not been so great. Peter up in the mountain had to be told to shut up. The, the Lord interrupted him in the middle of his little speech, which m makes him one of the only people I think God ever had to interrupt so he wouldn't continue sticking more feet in his mouth. But here, here they are. They come to the mountain and now they're going to have a big argument over who's the greatest. Can you see how that goes? You got James and John, the sons of thunder, who are full of zeal and nobody would question that. Well, they were part of the the group that went up on the mountain. So maybe they're in the runnings. Maybe they're going to sit in the right and left hand side of Jesus. Maybe that's why their mom came and asked Jesus, hey, listen, do what I say. And he goes, well, what is it you want? 
She says, have each one of my sons sit, one on the right and one on the left of you when you enter your kingdom. So I could see that, that that's probably going on. I could see Peter's probably a natural uh, in the running, but you know, the Lord just told him to shut up on the mountain. So maybe you could make him a Pope or something, you know, that'd be. So they're having an argument over who's the greatest. I'm sure you've never had this argument. I'm sure you don't struggle with your self-image in comparison to other people uh, at all, especially you ladies. I'm sure it's never a problem. Your self-image isn't ever a struggling issue. Um, it's so quiet in here. I think about Peter, who probably was one of the ones who thought he was in the, in the front running, and so did everyone else. And he's the one who ran away and denied the Lord three times. And he ran away. And I think about the failure of the disciples all along the way, and I see myself in them. Because there are times when I fail the Lord by not standing up and speaking up like I should, or, or soft peddling something that I shouldn't, or uh, stating something too much because it's in my benefit or something. So I think of the, the arguments that they have and we know who the greatest is because he told us the greatest of all time is Muhammad Ali, right? Because he said so. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest fighter of all time. Yeah, was, I could do Cassius Clay a little bit. I'm not going to attempt John Wayne, but he says he was the greatest, okay? Now, the interesting thing is they're all talking about who's the greatest. Who's the greatest? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> Jesus is the greatest. He is the greatest. He defeated death. He rose from the dead. He came into a human body, lived a perfect life, and died so that you don't have to. Now, there's nobody greater than that. To have an argument over who's the greatest in the very presence of Jesus is an amazing thing. It says in one of the other Gospels, they came into the house at Capernaum, and Jesus asked them, so, what were you guys talking about on the road? And they said, nothing. <laughs> really? And Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, <laughs> spoke. But they have this argument over who's the greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him and said to them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. And he who is least among you will be great. Notice what just Jesus didn't say. That you'll be the greatest, which is what they were arguing. He says, if you do this, you'll be great. And that's about all you can hope for. Because <laughs> no one will ever be the greatest. And yet, if you want to be great, he says, what you need to do is to be like this child. He takes a child and it brings, him, brings the child to himself and he puts his arms around this child, it says in the book of Mark. And as he's holding this child, he speaks to the disciples and said, any of you have the strength to be able to minister to this kid? Because this kid is me. And if you minister to this child, you're ministering to me. If you minister to the lowest, to the least, and it's interesting because most people think that you should have faith like a child, and yet nowhere in the scriptures does it say that you should have faith as a child. There are songs made about it. I've heard sermons spoken of it. But it doesn't say you should have faith as a child. It says you should become as a little child. What in the world does that mean? They were just arguing about who's greatest. Do little children argue about who's the greatest? They're completely dependent, completely. Without you, they wouldn't have a place to live. Without you, they wouldn't have a place to eat. Without you, they'd have no guidance. They'd have no discipline. They would become inmates for sure. They're 100% completely dependent. And I believe that's what Jesus was saying. You don't have any property. Everything you own was bought for you. And it's not even yours. And you'll outgrow it in probably a month or two. And that's the nature of what it is to be a child. Matthew 18, 3 says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, 
you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says, unless you guys cut this out and turn around, you're not going to make it. That's pretty strong talk. Unless you guys cut it out, you're not going to make it. Unless you are converted, unless you change your mind about this current conversation and route of your heart, you're not going to make it, guys. This is not the way. So Jesus is talking to them with a little child there and asking them to become like a child and stop their arguing. Mark 9.35 says, And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. You see, that defines what it is to become a child. It means somebody who's completely dependent, who's told what to do, who has chores, and, and you, you need to be under your parents' authority says that you want to be great, you got to be the least. This world does not teach you that. If you get an MBA, they don't teach you this in business school. You know, what you need to do is be the least and you need to be the servant of all. You know, the, the government of the people, by the people, for the people. Ah, that, that sounds interesting. It sounds like government serves the people, right? You know why? Because it's based on a biblical principle. That's why I, th I still think America is the greatest nation in the world, even though it's screwed up. It's the best that's out there, guys. Matthew 10, 16 says, Behold, I send you out as sheep among the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. It's interesting. We're supposed to be mentally sharp and very slick and careful about what we say and what we do, where we go and who we spend time with and all that. And yet gentle as doves without meaning any harm. It's, it's this quality of meekness. Meekness means you're standing there with your sword in a sheath and somebody's in your face and you're, you not in the, in the least are disturbed to the point where you're going to pull a sword. That's what meekness is. Meekness is strength under control, where you don't, you don't bust loose. But you have the ability to, but you don't. That, I think, is Jesus-style ministry. It's about being a servant leader, and certainly we know Jesus shows this. He says there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends, and then he did it. He said you must become as a little child, and he did it. He said, you have to be the servant of all, and he did it. He wasn't telling us to do something he himself didn't do. And so he did it as an example for us to follow. In verse 47, and Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm reading it again. I won't do that again today. And Jesus does it. At the Last Supper, at the, what we have converted into communion, he washes the disciples' feet after dinner. It's interesting. Usually you wash your hands after dinner and your feet before dinner. Jesus washes their feet after dinner because nobody thought it was important with their stinky feet and the other guy's face to wash their feet or anybody to wash. Them. And it was the lowest job that nobody wanted to do. It was for the servant of the house who's the lowest rank, maybe even a child. And nobody did it. And so they're all laying down eating with their feet in one another's face. And Jesus, when dinner had finished, washed their feet. And then they were all a little embarrassed. And Peter, most of all, said, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Absolutely not. I know who you are. And I know that I'm not worthy you washed my feet because I was lazy and didn't get to it. I would think twice if I saw Jesus get up and take off his outer garment and wrap a towel around his waist and he got the, the water, I'd be like, oh. I forgot to wash my feet. Hey, I'll be right back. You know, I, I would just get out of there and go wash my feet. But, and he gets to Peter and, and he says, listen, you're not going to wash my feet. And he says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. You see, Jesus not only instructs about being last, but he shows what it is to be last. And he forces Peter to sit there. I don't know if you've ever had your feet washed by someone else. It's not a pedicure, okay? This is different. It's <laughs> getting your feet washed. A pedicure, you know, they're jabbing and cutting and sanding and whatever it is that you need, you know. 
That's a little different, you know, snipping pieces of skin off. And this is, this is washing your feet. This is a much more intimate thing. And to have, a, have another man wash my feet, I can tell you I've had it happen. And it's very, it's embarrassing. It's, it's this close to being naked as far as I'm concerned. And it was just weird. But he forces Peter to sit there and let him do this because Peter had to learn to be served so that he might know how to serve. And I've learned the important lesson of being able to receive so that I might know how to give better because it's really hard for me to receive things. Any of you have that problem? It's hard to, like a favor, a compliment, you know, you want a mint. I never say no to a mint because I figure it's a hint. But Jesus does this. He demonstrates servant leadership by washing feet. That means that you look for a need and you look to fill it. You look to be a servant. And, and you know if you're a good servant or not when someone treats you like a servant and you react well. It's not when you think you're a good servant. You know, I, you know I'm a good servant. I, I do things. I do things for people. I'm thoughtful. I'm kind. What's Pastor Dave talking about? Well, what about when somebody treats you like a servant? Like, hey, pick that up. Who are you talking to? You talking to me? What am I, your slave? Eh. Oh, Lord, I blew it. Yes. You always know if you're a good servant by the way you react when someone treats you like one. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. We are told to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Well, when Jesus says, unless you become like a little child, you're not going to make it. Well, then what should I think of my ability to serve other people? How many boundaries, how many limits do I really have? Only the ones that the scripture puts there. So I don't know that there's anything that I should be asked that I shouldn't be able to do. And I realize I'm opening myself up to quite a problem with all of you people. Because it's an invitation. So maybe I should just shut up and move on. I'm moving on. <laughs> Humility is not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to, but considering yourself with sober judgment as God has given to each one a measure of faith. You know, there are some people that have great faith and can do great things. There are some very high capacity servants in this church. I, I, I think of Judy. I think of others who just run around like crazy and, and they love it and they enjoy it. And I think, you know, I'd probably need to sit down somewhere in the middle of all that. But they don't and they serve and it's a great example. And Jesus gives us the ultimate example by going to the cross. And it's not that he wanted to. He's like, Father, if this cup could pass for me, but not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus demonstrated it to the nth degree of what it is to be a servant. Now, after this event, now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said to him, do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. They just keep messing up, don't they? Jesus said, you know, you guys are arguing about who's the greatest. You've got to be like a little child. Well, we, these people were casting out demons. We told them to cut it out. Why would they do that? Because they couldn't do it just a little bit ago. We... Hey, cut that out. Why? We're, because, because you don't follow us. You know, there's a lot of that in Christianity. I'm just saying. So these are the sons of thunder. Uh, not, not the biker gang, but uh, John is one of the two of John and James, these sons of thunder. Jesus gives them that nickname, by the way. Uh, it's actually Boanerges, which... I'll define in just a minute, but it sounds like a biker gang. It sounds like they could be, you know, John, who's the youngest of them trying to shut somebody up from casting out demons. Yeah, yeah, we went here. We cast out a demon. Well, you can't do that. You're not us. 
I forbid you. Who's in charge with that kind of language? We told him, no way, man. You got to cut that out. In Acts 19, apparently this is something that people were doing. In Acts 19, verses 13 to 16, we're told of this story. It says, and then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. It's a third party demon casting. There were also seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know, but who are you? <laughs> Halloween's coming. It's, it's in my head. And then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Two things I never do leaving my house. <laughs> naked and wounded. Why? Because without Jesus, you possess no power. The Jesus who Paul preaches. Well, the demons know who Jesus is and they even know who Paul is, but who are you? You know, without Jesus, you have no power. With Jesus, you do have the power. In the name of Jesus, these things have to happen. And so there are people that will take the name of Jesus and do things, but if they're not against you, they're for you, Jesus says. And why are you taking charge, John? You could have gone on. Why, why do you think you have the authority to shut these people down? Because they're on our team. You know what they call that, right? They call that friendly fire. <laughs> when you shoot your friends instead of shooting the enemy. And this is, this is what John did. So this is another great thing for a disciple to do. Shoot your family members. That's a, it's a great thing. So uh, I, I love the block Bible. So they, they always make it real for me, you know. Here's the seven sons of Sceva over the, uh, the demon-possessed blockhead. Friendly fire is when you fire on your friends, and you should never, ever, ever do that. And you should never shoot your wounded either. It's said of the church that it's the only army that shoots their wounded. Well, it's not exactly true. There are a lot of, there are a lot of them. The Democrats will shoot their wounded. The Republicans will shoot their wounded. But everybody tends to do that, but the church should never do that. The wounded are those who need healing. They're not those who need to be discarded and kicked out. Verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. So as Jesus is going, he's traveling with a large entourage. And as they go, they need a bed and breakfast somewhere to crash. And so he sends people ahead. The interesting thing is he's going through Samaria. Samaria is an area of mixed breed people where the Jews have been captive uh, in Babylon. And then they were finally released, but they had procreated and had children and offspring and they ended up going back. And there was also a large contingent of other people that were there. And so they were a bit of a mixed breed people. And so the Jews kind of looked down on them because they weren't really hundred percent Jewish and they had their own Talmud. They had their own uh, Mount Gerizim to worship on. They had their own beliefs and they kind of, it was kind of like, you know, Judaism light. And so they made it their own. And so going through that area, people, there were those who wouldn't even go through that area. And there were some Pharisees who would wear blindfolds as they were led through this area because they didn't want to put their eyes on any of the filth of these people. It's a, it's a whole thing. So they're going through Samaria. And as, as they're going through, he sends some disciples ahead of time and into the town ahead to see if they can find a little bed and breakfast and a place to be. So who's he going to send? You know, the usuals. Isaiah 50 verses six and seven says, now this is a prophecy about the Messiah or, or the, the servant who would come. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. 
Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. It's interesting, same term that's used here in the New Testament, setting his face. I know that I will not be ashamed. These are uh, obviously a prophecy that was written, but it was also intended for a longer term, which is Jesus when he would come. And he says that he set his face like flint, uh, like this incredibly hard stone. Uh, by the way, they think that's what Jesus may have looked like. They lifted that from the shroud, if you know anything about the shroud. Anyway, I get a great education all week. Verse 53. But they did not receive him as he sent people into the town because his face was set on a journey to Jerusalem. In other words, here's a bunch of Jews traveling through our neighborhood. They want to stay at our place. What, are you kidding me? These are a bunch of Jews. These are Orthodox Jews. They're going to look down on us and call us names as they leave and kick the dust off their feet. We're not going to have any of these guys here. So that's why they didn't want to have them because they were Jews on their way to Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? This is like strike three, isn't it? And he turned and he rebuked them and he said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. They just keep taking their foot out just to insert another foot. James and John, remember they're the sons of thunder. This is why Jesus <laughs> called them that. He actually called them Boenergies. And it's probably because of this event, actually. In Mark 3, 17, as they're listing them, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boenergies, which is sons of thunder. Actually, sons of thunder, if you look at the original Greek, uh, it's not a Greek word, it's actually Aramaic. It comes from the Aramaic, which is interesting. It, and it doesn't mean sons of thunder. It means children of rage. But Sons of Thunder just sounds like a better biker name. <laughs> rage. Bo energies. It's rage. It's about rage. It's about being enraged. You know, somebody has an anger management problem. He's saying they need anger management. That's basically what he's saying. They have fervency, anger, impetuosity, and destructive rage. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever struggled with this particular demon. I have. It's basically selfishness from the top shelf. You know, when I get what I want, when I want, the way I want, or else. That's what rage. That's who these guys are. And Jesus called them, the, you know, the, the raging brothers. It's basically what it is. In Romans 12, 19 to 21... We're told very specifically, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the Romans, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. That seems very simple, right? Although it's hard to control yourself when you're driving, I find. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, means give place to God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now that takes a great deal of faith, doesn't it? Because you have to trust that the Lord's going to take care of it. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And not be overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what we're told to do as Christians. That can be a very difficult thing when you're a rageaholic right? And so these guys definitely haven't gotten to the Apostle Paul yet. In fact, Paul's not saved just yet. But it's interesting that Jesus deals with these guys and he's trying to cook some of the junk out of them as he's heading to Jerusalem before he's crucified. One of those things is rage. <coughs> Excuse me. So you think they were showing off? 
you know, you want us to call down fire from, wait a minute, there was a, there was a demon possessed kid back there. You couldn't do a thing for him. You see, I think it's because of this failure that they're trying to overcompensate. When I do a psychological analysis of the passage, <laughs> forgive me. I think they're trying to overdo something, you know, like a, forgive me. I think they were showing off. Hey, we told these guys to shut up. Hey, you shouldn't do that. They're on our team. Oh, okay. Well, when we were in town, they wouldn't, they didn't want to see us. You want us to call down fire from heaven, Lord? You know, like, dude, take it easy. I think they were showing off. That's what I think. James and John. James, different James, chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That is a passage that I've had to memorize and speak to myself. Getting angry and losing it helps no one. It won't teach anyone. It will not be profitable in any way for you to and let go. It won't help anybody. The anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. That all makes sense, right? You might want to put that in a little memory capsule. Take that with you. Proverbs 19.11 says, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. Jesus is demonstrating that here, and I think he does it all the time. But to overlook a transgression, I don't know, if you're like me, I feel like it is my job to find every transgression and bring it to light all the time under any circumstances, no matter who's there, or whether it's late or it's early or it's afternoon, or whether you're a stranger or a good friend. I feel it is my job to let you know that there's something wrong with you. I think I am the heavenly police here on the earth, put here by God to be his cop. And it's all right, that guy's in a cage right now in here. And uh, it's called my flesh. And yet, why do we think we have the right to do like John does? Hey, stop casting demons out. You're not, you're not hanging with us. Why do we think we have the right to do that? Call down fire from heaven like Elijah did. You know, by the way, when Elijah called down fire from heaven and God answered his prayer, it wasn't on people. It was on, an, it was on a sacrifice. Of course, after that, he cut everyone's head off, but <laughs> calling down the fire is not a good exegetical uh, theological concept. Anyway, so Jesus corrects him and he says, listen, I didn't come here to kill people. I came here to save people. You don't know what spirit you are of. And so the question is, what spirit is that? It could be the spirit of self, could be a demonic thing, but it's definitely not Christ-like. And Ephesians 4 gives us a picture of what it is to be a disciple. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, the, the, the fruitless imaginings, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Who these people, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all on cleanliness and greediness. But you've not learned Christ. Uh, you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard of him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man. Uh, it's, ladies, this not means you get divorced. It means you take the fleshly part of you, which the world tells you what to do, your, your economics tell you what to do, your impulses tell you what to do. You put the old man, which grows corrupt according to these deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your 
mind. Notice where it starts. That you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Now there's an interesting balancing act. And do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, don't go to bed while you're angry. Nor give place to the devil, which is giving the devil a foothold in your life by being angry and holding on to something. Let go of it because the devil's got a hold on you if you hold on to it. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. That means anything that is seasoned with self. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So it's not about what you want to say. It's about what they need to hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, which is blah, 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 and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, which is imagining how you're going to get back at somebody. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So if you want a little instruction on what a disciple really looks like, this is a really good package from Ephesians. Uh, Colossians has a bunch of these little nuggets too. Great examples, great devotionals, good to get your head straight in the morning and read and say, okay, Lord, all right, no stealing, no lying. <laughs> instead of lying, I'm going to speak the truth and that which edifies other people. And instead of stealing, I'm going to work hard so I've got something to give away. And, and we have to condition our minds to think like Jesus because we don't naturally do that. A, a little human being, uh, you know, just doesn't do that not without having a regenerate experience. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Like a good soldier. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So you get somebody that comes up all zealous and Lord, we'll, we'll go with you wherever you want us to go. He goes, yeah, really? How's homelessness look for you? Is that on your radar of being a disciple? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, you mean I got to be homeless? Well, I am. You want to follow me? You got to be like me. You got to be homeless. Does that mean if you own a home or you rent a place that you're not walking in Christ? There's some people that tell you you would. You need to join, join some monastic order and, you know, go up into a fortress somewhere and disappear from life. But Jesus is talking about priorities. Home is a priority for many of us, right? You know, you, you work a hard day, you go home, and it's almost like you take a breath and relax, right, when you step in the door. <sighs> Maybe you kick the shoes off. Maybe you say, honey, I'm home. Maybe the house smells of dinner. Your favorite easy chair cries out to you. The remote in a location that's nearby. Catch up on today's news as I put my feet up. You see, home is a place of comfort. It's a place of security. It's a place of luxury. And all of us within the hearing of my voice are at the top 1% of this earth. If you have shoes, a roof, indoor plumbing, you have food, you have fresh running water, you are at the top 1% of the richest people in this world. Sometimes we forget that. Home is about having comfortable things, things that we choose to have, even decorations, right? We've got all kinds of tchotchkes and things and stuff. That's what home is. And Jesus says, do you realize that you might be giving up the right to have a home? 
if you become my disciple? Do you realize that you don't have a right to say, well, I have a right to have a place to live. Well, are you willing to give that up? Or is that the main priority of your life? There are some people who make that the main priority of their life. Yeah, so what are you doing? Oh, I'm moving. Where are you moving? Oh, I'm moving, I'm moving on up, you know, down south. Where I can get a house for a lot cheaper and, you know, rolling tracts of land. And it's the, the promised land down there. Because that's where people in New Jersey go. We go to the promised land. It's all about the house. It's all about the comforts. It's all about lessening my responsibility to pay for things and getting away from Murphy. <laughs> Which you have an opportunity to because the, the vote's coming up. So it's about home. Are you willing to leave your home? Do you have a right to say, this is mine and I am entitled to, you know, this whole entitlement thing. You know, the American way might be something that you need to sacrifice on the altar of Christianity. You know, we have, we have this American way, the American way, we have a right to have a house and a picket fence and 2.5 children and, uh, you know, a good job and free health care and free education. I want to be a doctor. This entitlement that we think we have. This man coming to Jesus had no idea what he was saying. I want to be your disciple. And he goes, well... Foxes even have places to stay, and the birds have places to stay, but what about you? Are you willing to give that up? The comfort of a home? Are you willing to sacrifice that? Better yet, are you willing to have somebody move in with you who maybe isn't as fortunate as you? Mess with my privacy, Pastor. You better just shut it down. I saw this, uh, I saw this interesting thing. It says, don't trust your children's patriotism to the public schools. And there's a woman reading to her grandchildren, presumably. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Do we, do we need Antifa, Black Lives Matter, do we need, or do we just need the Constitution? We need the Bible. That all men are created equal. And that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among uh, these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of Brazilian barbecue. <laughs> yeah, we think, we think that it, this pursuit of happiness entitles us to every comfort and imagination that we have, and it doesn't. Because Jesus wants us to lay it all down. Lay it all down. Verse 59. And then he said, meaning Jesus, to another, follow me. So what an honor for Jesus to call somebody instead of them coming up and presenting themselves to be called. Jesus calls another one, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Well, this is not the challenge of stuff and of comfort and of home, people in our lives. And Jesus is not, you know, he, the, the guy isn't home. His father didn't just die sitting at home on a slab and waiting for a funeral. This is a term meaning, let me go back home and take care of my family. Usually you take care of your family until your family is deceased, your parents. You know, I've got to take care of my parents. I've got to be around for them. I mean, they're a priority in my life. I'm supposed to honor my father and mother, right? It's using that as an excuse over serving God, over doing what the Lord would have you do. And so it's, okay, Lord, I'll do that. But first, he's supposed to be first. And, you know, going home to bury your parents might take, oh, who knows how long. Matthew 10, 37 to 39, Jesus says this, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That sounds like one of the cruelest passages I have read recently. Jesus insists on being first. 
Anything else is idolatry. And it doesn't matter how good it is. Good is the enemy of best. In Mark 10, 25 to 31, Jesus says this after a rich man came up to him, a rich young ruler, and he, he says, what do I have to do to enter the kingdom? And you know the story. He throws some commandments at him. He goes, oh, I've done all these since I've been a youth. And, and he looks at him and he loves him and he tells him, he says, there's one thing that you lack. And he says, take all that you own, go and sell it and give it to the poor and then come and follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. And the man walked away sorrowful because he had many possessions. That's a guy who wasn't willing to leave his, ho leave his home. And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished because they believed that richness was a gifting from God for those who were righteous. And that was the only scenario they understood. And they were astonished and said among themselves, who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men, it is impossible but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. You guys probably have seen that on a bumper sticker, you know, things are possible. Yeah, all things are possible about getting to heaven because it's impossible otherwise without Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, it's impossible without Jesus Christ. And Peter began to say to him, see, we've left all and followed you. Thanks, Peter. Stop patting yourself on the back, buddy. So Jesus answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, there is not, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and for the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Jesus spelling out what it is to be a disciple says everything has to be subservient to our relationship with him. Amen? Amen. And that's the tug, isn't it? Because the thorns of this world like to encroach and choke the seed of the word down so that we don't produce fruit. And the only way to produce fruit is when we abide in the vine. Verse 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who were in my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So we have these three scenarios. One is the foxes have holes and the birds have nests. You got to be willing to give up your home, your comfort, your stuff. Number two, you have to be willing to leave people. The most important people in your life have to take second place to Jesus Christ. The third is activity. I have to go home. I've got to be busy. And if you remember, they're growing up in an agrarian society. So everyone has a farm. Everybody's got a vine. Everybody's got animals. That's their life. And so let me go home, take care of my business. Let me take care of everything, all of my busyness, my life. I've got to, you know, I've got some things I got to do. I got to tie off some loose ends and take care of things, you know, before I come to Christ and make God the most important thing. You ever share Christ with somebody and get that back? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'll accept Christ in my deathbed. That's going to be pretty hard if you're crossing a bridge and you get hit by a plane, which has happened. It's going to be pretty hard if you're just going about your daily work up in the Twin Towers and you get hit by a plane. You're not going to get a chance. So he says, the one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy. In Luke 17, 28 to 33, we'll get to someday. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate and drank and they bought and sold and they planted and they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so it will be in the day when the son of man is revealed. In that day, he was on the housetop and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down and take them away. And likewise, the one who was in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. 
It's interesting how Jesus speaks this more than once to his disciples. And this is in, you know, Luke 17, as we get there, remember Lot's wife who turned around and because she had her eyes on the lifestyle that she was missing, her heart was attached to it. She turned around and, and because of that, presumably she lingered and she was turned into a pillar of salt. I imagine the pyroclast, um, clinging to her body. It's interesting because in Israel, there's a thing called this pillar is called Lot's wife. I love the internet. It's so wonderful. You can fly, you can go to Israel, you know, just vicariously. So closing wanted disciples because the ones he has lack power. They lack love. They want to call down fire from heaven and they lack discipline. Sound like anybody, you know, you're all looking at me <laughs> and you're right. There are times when I lack power. There are times when I lack love and times when I lack discipline. Second Timothy one seven says this for God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and a sound mind. Amen. The three things that you see these disciples lacked in this little section of Luke are those very three things. Having a sound mind, a mind that is disciplined. That is, it's not about being sober. It's uh, sober minded, it says in the King James. Being of sound mind means to be firmly planted, having your feet firmly planted and being reasonable, being disciplined to do those things that you know that you should do and not the things that you feel like doing all the time. I look at the disciples and I see single mindedness is needed. Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem and he was single minded about his mission as we should be in serving him that they're to be unselfish. It's not about them. Just because there are others who are casting out demons doesn't make your ministry any less so. We're to be non-competitive. We're to be inclusive. We're not to exclude anyone from the kingdom of God if they're willing to follow Christ. Non-judgmental. Boy, that's a, that's a tough one. Gracious and forgiving prioritized and disciplined and sacrificing all for Jesus. I think being a true disciple incorporates all of these things. And if we're careful, I think the Lord can do great things through us as we observe the bad examples of the disciples and the good examples of what Jesus teaches us to do. I'm going to ask you guys to prayerfully consolidate some of the things that you've heard here today. Some of the things that the Lord may have been speaking to you personally of some changes that maybe need to happen. Every week I get the privilege of sifting through the word and doing study and discovering new things that he wants to do in my life. I hope that it's the same for you guys. I pray that the Lord speak to your hearts. Mm -hmm.